Hello again. We are back with another episode of Quarantine to celebrate LGBT History Month. My name is Mitch, and I use he, him, his pronouns. My name is Amy, and I use she, her, hers pronouns. And this week, our question for each other is what your favorite Halloween candy is. It's not technically a Halloween candy for me in that it's not something that traditionally gets handed out when you're trick-or-treating, but I am a complete maniac for caramel apples and candy apples Mm. both i love them and especially like the ones where you get the caramel and the peanuts like i could eat so many of those every season and i do i love candy apples but i'm a baby head and i cut it up in pieces because that's what cameron does i live in fear of breaking my teeth no, I so live in fear of breaking my teeth. I have ceramic teeth. Like, I have veneers on my front teeth. Mm-hmm. So I live in fear of snapping them off because gotcha. then I'll look... I will look like I have a really, really convincing Halloween zombie costume. Gotcha. I'm not about that. So I cut them up, but I do love a good candy apple. Um, I think... I'm a big Wonka candy fan. Yes. I love fruity candy, but my absolute favorite is Nerds. Me too. I'm obsessed with Nerds. I like if I could just like dip my face in a bowl of Nerds, I would be the now, happiest like, person. Nerds or Nerds rope? No, Nerds. Nerds. Nerds rope are delicious, and they have their own time and place. But it's very satisfying to grab, like, a handful of nerds and just shove it into my mouth like a horse in a theater. (laughs) (laughs) See, nerds are not a candy that you can eat in a movie theater because if you spill them, it's going to sound like you just dropped a bowl of lentils. And you have to pick them all up before you, the vampire, can come in. Um, But nerds rope, like, they're all attached to the rope, so it's much easier to get that nerds goodness when you can't see. (laughs) My problem with nerds rope, though, is that when you're pulling it out of its wrapper, it knocks nerds off. For one. Yeah, under the little chute, and then you just... I know, but if I'm going to shoot them into my mouth with a wrapper, I may as well shoot them into my mouth with a box. (laughs) (laughs) That is fair. Thank you. That is fair. Thank you. All right. (laughs) (laughs) So, I... Speaking of theaters, um, I am talking about somebody who I had never heard of until very recently. Riley is very excited for this, because she was with me as I did all of this research. Um, the performer Julian L. Tinge, who was one of the most famous female impersonators ever. Mm. So, he was born in Boston, Massachusetts, actually a town outside of Boston, in 1881. And he was born um, William Dalton. His mother, Julia, used to enter him in baby shows, which was a thing that people did back then. It was like a beauty pageant for babies. People still do those. Really? I had never heard They've of fallen out of favor, but yeah. Apparently it was a big deal back then. Um, his father, Michael, was a barber, but he decided he could make it rich by prospecting. So he moved the family out to California in 1885 and was ultimately unsuccessful. So they moved to Butte, Montana, where he restarted a barber practice. So it was there that Billy met his friend at school, William L. Tinge, and they both loved theater and doing amateur theater through their school. So they would actually go and meet the trains in Butte to welcome vaudeville performers that were coming to town. And they would become enchanted with like these really sweet, really mannerly little young men. And, um, Now, mind you, vaudeville performers weren't well-respected. They were kind of looked down upon the same way that, like, circus performers were. Mm -hmm. Um, But one night, it's said that Billy was visiting with some chorus girls that had come into town, and they decided to dress him up and put him in their chorus line because his dancing was so good. And his father found out and was enraged, and um, he ended up sending Billy and his mother back to Boston, where he had apprenticed his son to be a clerk there. And so he was 14 when he got sent back. So Billy worked his way up and soon joined a bank clerks association, which held drama performance fundraisers that followed the Ivy League tradition of having men play all the female roles. So there was an organization in Ivy League schools called the Hasty Pudding Club, 
where... Do you know why it was called that? No. Oh. I have no idea. Okay. I didn't really deep dive on that because, as you can tell by the many pages here, I deep dived on a lot of other things. <laughs> um, but this is when he changed his stage name to Julian L. Tinge after he was a smash hit in a lead female role in a production and was written up in the Boston Globe. Um, and so he changed, of course, his name to honor his mother and then um, his friend back in Butte that he had first found this interest with. So he was in some performances like Miss Simplicity, Baron Humbug, and soon a show called Mr. Wicks of Wickham, which was his first commercial show. And so that was based on a story plot device called Charlie's Aunt, where the plot literally puts the survival of the character on cross-dressing against their will to navigate a tricky situation mm. so this plot device is one that we talk about all the time because this is a plot device that we find in things like some like a hot tootsie and bosom buddies so this show mr wicks of wickham is what brought julian Tinge to new york city for the first time in 1904 which was also known as the year broadway was born oh. so operetta fused with vaudeville and burlesque routines to create an all-American dramatic art form, which was the musical comedy. This was actually um, the second art form that was all-American in theater, but I will come back to that later. So Eltinge became really high in demand, and he became friends with um, George M. Cohen, who persuaded him to join his Freemason Lodge alongside the would-be founders of United Artists and 20th Century Fox, Universal Pictures, wow. and Columbia Pictures. So he made a lot of really important connections early on. B.F. Keith was a major vaudeville theater owner and demanded cleanliness and a lack of coarseness from his performers. He actually invited a Sunday school dignitary to attend rehearsals of his shows to judge propriety. So Keith advised Martin Beck, order of who owned the Orpheum Theater chain, to sign Elton for a complete circuit tour. So he returned and performed at Keith's Union Square Theater on New Year's Day, 1906, an ad for which appeared on the back page of the very first issue of Variety. So, does his dad ever come back into play at any point or like do we know what dad thought of him nope. being sent back to boston only to join broadway <laughs> like, yeah that backfired real hard on him. i really think that um like i love how much it backfired on dad we don't hear about dad again in any of the stories about him but mom stayed with him right on always. we love parental support yes so 20 years later those two companies would merge to become rko and radio pictures so he was really right in the heart of the beginning of so much. And I'll get into this more in a bit too, but he was considered artistic. He was considered really like skilled in his performance, um, kind of hypocritically to some other performers at the time. Um, but in 1907, he actually went on a European tour, which included a command performance at Windsor Castle for King Edward VII, wow. who presented him the next day with a rare all-white bulldog out of appreciation for his performance. Oh my gosh. So Variety said that El Tinge had an odd gift for female mimicry and called his act artistic far and above what was then called female impersonation. This act now in 1908 started to connect into what was called minstrel theater which while still popular at the time was incredibly racist um, one reviewer actually declared just as a white man makes the best stage negro so in this case a man gives a more photographic interpretation of femininity than the average woman is able to give so just to touch on that um, I dropped into an episode of PBS's Crash Course Theater to learn more about minstrelry, which was used at the time to reinforce ugly caricatures and create really harmful melodrama around race. And we're not made better by ignoring that this was a part of theater history, which is why I wanted to touch on it. So these were the stereotype performances where 
things like Jim Crow came up for the first time, which then led to a bunch of discrimination. Um, that was a character of a performer named T.D. Rice that Elton worked around. Um, Broadway actually had a statue of him in blackface for oh many, many years. So Al Jolson, who was very famed at the time, also performed in blackface. Um, and a lot of influences from this are still prevalent in theater today. So it's important to talk about that history and remember that it's always inappropriate to wear blackface. Um, but it was a major part of his career that enabled him to become a major star in vaudeville. He actually would go on to make a deal with Al H. Woods, who inspired the role of Max Bialystok in The Producers. And he gave him his own corporation with $10,000 of capital and paid him seventeen fifty a week, like with a period at the $17. end, not in the $1,750. Like one thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. I can do numbers. A week. A week. Do you know what that equals out to? You now? know, I looked it up. It equals to forty-seven thousand dollars. Forty-seven nine hundred and forty-six dollars. Wow, that's a paycheck. Yeah, that's literally more than a lot of people I know make in a year. Yeah. <laughs> a week. So this actually made Al Tinge the highest paid actor in the world. Wow. Um, broke all kinds of records. Otto Harlock wrote a new show for him called The Fascinating Widow. The connection had been made by Eltinge's big fan, Oscar Hammerstein. And so in this story, Eltinge plays the role of a man who's in love with a girl who has been forbidden by her mother to marry him. So he disguises himself as a woman to win the heart of the other suitor so he can humiliate him publicly. So the story carries this up to the verge of a wedding where he discloses the truth. And now the mother sees him as being a better man and consents to him marrying her daughter. So the humiliation was tricking this man into accidentally being gay? Like, is that, is, okay. Yep. Yep. We do not love that. So, of course, like, this lays the groundwork for all kinds of stereotypes that persist in the way these stories are told today, even. Um, so from then on, all of his roles were deliberately written for him to switch between the sexes portrayed to showcase his talent for that transformation um because people ate it up like they loved it it was super sensationalized that show actually went on to become a nationally touring show and broke box office records all across the country including in butte montana where his career started so there's a full circle moment for you um many children actually attended his shows with their mothers his presentation was considered indisputably wholesome, and it was considered a family act. Okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so it, obviously, like, views changed. Um, and so this story was really interesting to me because it shows, like, the ebb and flow of perception that happened in culture. It's so interesting to me to consider. To, to know that society used to consider blatant racism wholesome. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, many children's toys, many mm -hmm. children's stories. A lot of that was based in that crazy racism that came from the minstrel performance, which, again, was the first all-American art form. That's where we started. So while he was on this tour... Al Woods was building the Elt Hinge Theater on 42nd Street, as well as establishing the Julian Elt Hinge Magazine, the Julian Elt Hinge Cosmetics Company, and a cigar brand, all with his name on it. Wow. So Elt Hinge personally wrote articles for his named magazine to advise women on health and appearance tips and encouraged them to engage in the gentle art of boxing. Yes. Uh -huh. Are they from a different planet? <laughs> I know. This sounds so unbelievable, but yeah, here we are. Riley also wants to contribute. 
Um, so he actually supported the women who bought and sold his cosmetics really like well and is said to have wholeheartedly supported the movement for women's suffrage, which was really considered odd at the time because he had a real camaraderie with women who were fighting for liberation, but like next to no positive outside of business relationships with men. So Altinge continued to build his career by putting down other so-called female impersonators, insisting that he was a real man playing a woman's role a la Shakespeare, but most men disliked him and made rude jokes. The element of being forced to do it in his stories as being why he portrayed a woman cemented a double standard for the sake of acceptability. The idea that one would enjoy and be validated by performing as high femme was considered completely unfathomable. Nobody would do that by choice, only by force. That was the way these stories were told. Um, his manager, to make sure that he was reaffirmed as masculine, would make him box champion boxers. And every curtain call, he was expected to rip off his wig and light up a cigar to reaffirm that he was a man. So he was accepted by the New York City elite as a business asset, someone that they could profit off of the work of, mm -hmm. but never as a friend. So New York City really prided itself at the time even as being progressive, but we know that that was not true because it would have cost him absolutely everything to let even the light, slightest hint of homosexuality slip. He actually was guarded by paid guards when he was at home, where he lived with only his mother and his animals. So did those guards also follow him around when he was outside, so like he couldn't even have relationships with anybody? Yep. Wow. So he had a lot of automobiles and possessions to keep him company, as well as the company of his mother, but that was... Does it, that doesn't quite cut it. Yeah. Yeah, that's really frustrating. So he appeared in a silent film in New York City, and he was a natural-born entrepreneur and realized it was a huge opportunity, and so he headed to Hollywood where he secured a three-picture contract. His first silent film picture in 1917 on that contract was to sell Liberty Bonds to raise funds for World War I, which had just begun. Um, so he was in that alongside Mary Pickford, who was very, very famous as a silent film star, and she was very fond of him and dubbed him Lady Bill. So he went on to do a movie next called The Countess Charming, which was written by Donald Crisp, who was famed as being in D.W. Griffith's super racist The Birth of a Nation. So I mentioned that as well because he continued to use those connections for his career. Out in Hollywood, he became a lavish partier, and he built the first actor's mansion, which was called Villa Capistrano, and it is now also known as the Pink Castle on Silver Lake in Edenville. Mm -hmm. It is still standing, and both Victor Fleming and Steven Spielberg have since owned it. So it is wow. still there, and it's a gorgeous gorgeous mansion so he moved in with his mother and he would actually ride horseback from his mansion to the studio to film what a dream i know right so 1929 he would make his first talking picture he at this point had been in the isle of love and two of his own films madam behave which was about a woman who would not behave shocking and a film adaptation of the fascinating widow so no one has ever had a firm grasp on his sexual orientation, but he was a literal friend of Dorothy Parker, which I have talked oh about gosh. before. He often partied with her, and she actually referred to him as ambisextrous instead of bisexual. She called him ambisextrous, which I thought was very interesting. Um, but there is literally no record of him ever having a lover of either or any gender hopefully it overall was by his choice and not force because what a lonely life i think he sacrificed a lot for his career that's the impression i got yeah. the impression i really got was that it, it's a sad thing that was kind of impressed on him 
Um, so, Amy, what else happened in 1929? I don't know. A major American historical event. 1929. Yeah, okay, so the Great Depression. Me. I was like, there are so many things that happened in 1929. Yeah, but the big one is okay. the stock market crash. So we've been doing so many deep dives back to other videos that I was like, what did I talk about that happened in 1929? <laughs> the Great You're, Depression, of course. You were like the gif of like the math equation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, where I was just yeah. like calculating, calculating. So the stock market crash, the Great Depression hit, um, which contributed to the downfall of theater, um, especially vaudeville. It lost popularity because um, people couldn't afford to go and people couldn't afford to spend money on these lavish productions anymore. Well, I talked about, um, and I'll talk about the Hayes Code in a video, but we, when I was telling you a little bit about what I learned about um, the Hayes Code that was that Motion Pictures Act laws, um, in 1929 during the Great Depression, it was sort of lax because um, that was what would bring in money was these sort of salacious stories. Mm -hmm. And then coming out of the Great Depression as order was restored, crackdowns hit mm -hmm. on cross-dressing and public through the Hayes Code, um, which forced Al Tinge to not be able to perform. And that was explicitly done to curb homosexual activity. Um, like that's why those codes existed. So El Tinge was now forced to perform in the far less glamorous nightclubs that he'd looked down on people for performing in for so much of his career. It was during an engagement at Billy Rose's Diamond Horseshoe nightclub in Times Square. Mind you, like I didn't know this existed as a thing, but that's also the name of a restaurant in Frontierland in Disney World. So that's got to be connected to theater history. Yeah. Um, Eltinge fell ill, and on March 7th, 1941, 10 days later, he died from the effects of what had been a massive cerebral hemorrhage. Oh, my gosh. So he was 59 years old when he died, and he was buried at Forest Long Memorial in Glendale, California. So, in 1998, I thought this was really interesting, they actually picked up and moved the El Tinge Theater, which was now called the Empire Theater, 150 feet down the block in Times Square. They had it pulled by balloons of Abbott and Costello, who had performed there, um, so it could become the lobby of a new theater that's now owned by the AMC. Oh, wow. So... What's really fascinating about it is, this is another case of me not knowing my history, but Jeffrey Marsh actually wrote a piece for Variety in 2018, over a century later, about Mr. Eltinger's role in paving the way for cross-gender and trans representation by playing with gender the way he had done. Um, so they reference a mural that still exists in that lobby that is of Lady Song, Lady Dance, and Lady Music, the three muses in the Altinge Theater, all three of whom are actually portraits of Julian Altinge. Oh, wow. And he actually, his crowds had far outgrown the capacity of that theater once it was built while he was in New York. So he never actually performed in the theater that was named for him. He never appeared there, which I think is also very interesting. Um, so the work of Mark Berger, who did a lot of preserving of his work, um, is the reason that I was able to learn so much about Mr. Altinge. And that article from Jeffrey Marsh is what really tipped me off that this was even a part of our history. And it's so connected to so many things that we've talked about before. Um, so I thought it was fascinating. Yeah, I never knew any of that. I've never even heard of his name. Me neither. And yet, so much of his work continues to be reflected in stereotypes and tropes mm -hmm. mostly unfortunately mm -hmm. um and you know what a sad life to have lived too too but he uh he really did do a lot to um demonstrate the art inherent in female impersonation mm -hmm. yet sacrificed so much of it to be able to continue to do it I, yeah. Yeah. I, just, I, I have nothing. Wow. 
Yeah. Well, and too, I think it's really interesting, especially since the first documented um, men performing as female in America were black men for then that to become a tool that was used to mock them in minstrelry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because a lot of it was based on ballroom culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, it just shows that like people throughout history have really used that multi-sectional marginalization to try and push each other down. Um, which I hope that our generation can continue to do the work to Mm -hmm. stop doing. Well, and definitely the generation that's following us is already rising up and ready to take a stand. Yeah, we've come a very long way, and it's really important that we look at our history and look at the parts that maybe we don't really want to look at, Mm -hmm. because they are disturbing. um, And And they can't have forward movement unless you acknowledge what's happened already. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So definitely the theater world... I've learned to look through a different lens at from this research that I have done. Um, and I'm really excited that when I do return to New York City in the future, um, I'm going to go to the theater to see the mural oh, yeah. in person. Yeah. So. I feel like that should be a, we record quarantine live from there. Oh, we should. That would be so fun someday. And when we're able to get down there doing some partnership with some of the amazing LGBT rights organizations that are leading a lot of really important work down there. Like you've got the Ali Forney Center, the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, the Marsha P. Johnson Foundation. Mm -hmm. All of those are based in New York City. Mm -hmm. So I would love to go visit them. Let's do it. And support their work. Yeah. Let's do it. Absolutely. All right. Well, this wraps up um, specifically this month's history about the LGBTQ community, but we will, I mean, we're, we'll be coming back with more history because we love history, but, um, yeah, that wraps up October and we'll be coming at you next week with another new video. Um, November marks a lot of important days as well, um, especially within the transgender community, including Trans Day of Remembrance, which is coming up on November 20th. Mm -hmm. So you will definitely be seeing and hearing from us about that history and the importance of observing that, um, as well as some other fun stuff. Absolutely. So until then, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.